Prancing Skunk Podcast. My name is Colleen Sheehan. I'm Mike Chan. Strap in, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. Welcome to the third episode of our podcast series. And in today's episode, I figured we should talk about your racing experience because um, growing up my whole life, you've always been racing and it's a big part of um, kind of our job too in the sense that uh, we get sent a lot of race cars because so many people know that you have so many years of experience racing who else to send a race car to to sell besides another race car driver so uh when did you start racing well with me everything's a history lesson so in the 70s the u.s had massive inflation chairman volcker the head of the fed cranked prime to 21 percent and the economy tanked by 85 the economy was turning around and i realized that prices had been knocked way down there was a lot of pent-up demand and so there was going to be a market for special Ferraris. So in um, 1985, we started digging out Ferraris that had been, you know, what today would be barn finds. Mm -hmm. And in 1985, we had a knock at the door and a group of Japanese showed up uh, wanting to do an article on shops in California. And the two of those led into uh, a real attempt to buy and corner the old Ferrari race car market. So in February of 1986, I bought a uh, 340 Barquetta, serial number 124, that had raced at Le Mans in 1951 and finished eighth. And I paid the staggering sum of 150000 for it <laughs> with a... What's that car worth today? Four million. So I paid 150000 for it in February and thought, damn, I think I should race this thing at Monterey, uh, because at the time, everybody in the world came to Monterey. If you're there with the car, everybody will see it. So I decided I needed to do some racing lessons because I'd gone blind earlier in one eye, had a cornea transplant, and I could now see. So um, I went to the Jim Russell School at Laguna Seca and did a three-day uh, race program. I loved it so much, I signed up for their school race program. Didn't you say the first time you ever got in a race car, um, you, you were the passenger, you got in the car, and first lap around, you were like, oh, this isn't that bad. Second lap this. around, yeah, I think I could do this. And by the third lap, you went, oh, shit, okay, this is getting serious. Well, fourth lap, uh, you were like, why did I get in this car on the day this guy wants to commit suicide? That was a, um, that was a, um, Penske uh, Trans Am. It was a Trans Am championship winner with Donahue driving. It was a blue car, a Sunoco car. And a friend of mine, Paul Schwartz, was a, an SECA record holder. And we were at uh, Riverside, and I didn't really understand racing. That would be, boy, back after my cornea transplant. That would be like 82 or 83. And when you're coming into turn six, it goes real steep uphill very quickly. And what happens is you can come in at, at an insane speed because when you hit It'll the hill, you hit in. the brakes and it just sucks it down into the ground. And you can really scrub off speed. What I did know is that if you screw up, it's a steel wall at the time. You literally popped over the hill, hit a wall, and you were toast. Um, and so I, a lot of people had died there. So we'd come in to turn six at this insane speed. And I really, I really thought, for a second, I thought, why has this guy decided to commit suicide with me in the car? <laughs> I truly thought we were going to die. And uh, when he slammed on the brakes and it just sucked into the ground and we slowed and made the corner, I went, I got to do this. <laughs> so I went from, I think I can do this, to, whoa, to, I'm going to die, to, I want to do this. <laughs> so, a lot of emotions all at once. Oh, well, that, each lap back then well, was probably... In a short amount of time. Yeah, Riverside was a long course. Anyway, um, so in 1986, I went to the Russell School, did the three-day school, and then signed up for the racing program, which is if you... I wanted to do three races at a weekend. They wouldn't let me. They'd only let me do two. So I did two races every weekend, and I did that for 12 weekends. That's 24 races. Then the next weekend, I did an SCCA national race, uh, and it went on from there. I went to 
uh, those were in Mazdas, Formula Mazdas. So I went from Formula Mazda to Pro Mazda to um, SCCA GT1 to uh, IMSA GTO, Trans Am, Camel Light, and in between I drove because we sold hundreds of race cars. Well, and I sold, you've done. Uh, I drove hundreds of race cars. And you've done other specialty races like the Millamilia. Yeah, I did the Millamilia three times. I did the Copa d'Italia. Yeah, but you you not you didn't just race the Millamilia three times. You did it in cars like Lulu well, Bell, the, the a two fifty yeah, Tesserosa. The, the first time I did it in uh, uh, three forty uh, coupe, the serial number eighty two which was the uh, 1951 Millimilia winner. So that attracted a lot of attention. The second time I did it in Lulabelle, which is a 250 uh, TR, as you know, white with blue. The third time I did it in a 750 Monza. And in Lulabelle, I mean, I, that one sticks out the most because the TR is one of my favorite cars. I think they're just stunning. But um, you said that you, People, so Sylvester Stallone was supposed to be racing. Right, uh, I think I was number 286 and he was supposed to be the car behind us. And so we had, because I'm Canadian, I had a Canadian flag on the front. My co-driver had an American flag on the front. So as we'd go into town, we're driving a white TR, you know, a white Ferrari with a blue stripe, that's different. And with the American flag, uh, and uh, I think it was 286, a race number, everybody thought we were Stallone. So as we, and we're wearing the Snoopy helmets with the goggles, so you mm -hmm. can't really tell. So as we'd go <laughs> into, these, into these little Italian villages in the middle of nowhere, the people would be screaming, Stallone, Stallone, Stallone. And uh, <laughs> the 250 TR is a perfect car, wow. Um, I could go into a corner and just for fun, throw it into a, a drift and just drift it with power on through the corner. It was one of those wonderful cars that has the right amount of horsepower with the right amount of suspension, with a solid rear axle, with a really smooth shifting, perfectly, it was a perfect car. One of the best race cars I've ever driven in my life, which is why 250TRs are, you know, well over $20 million today. Yeah. Well, and. Didn't at one point, was it maybe in the TR, maybe in one of the other times you went, uh, you had the little nuns and all the oh, school children? That was, in the, that was in the TR. We're blasting through a village, and there's uh, the Italian school with the nuns with the, you know, uh, the, the flying nun type headdress on, and they were literally jumping up and down with the kids. The nuns were jumping up and down <laughs> as we went through. And when that would happen, I'd throw the car into a little slide just for effect and, you know, imagine a V12, drop it down a gear, throw it in a slide, blast yep. it through, or the piazzas, just blast through the piazza in a big slide. It was great fun, <laughs> great fun. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> it's hard to beat. Yeah, and today, you know, you think about you know, doing that in a 20 plus million dollar car, and it's kind of hard to yeah. comprehend. Yeah, because at the time, Lulu Bell would have been, that was the second time you sold her, I think, or third? First. First, oh, okay. So the first time I bought Lulu Bell for a million and sold it for a million nine five, then got it back for two five and sold it for, I think, three, then got it back for four five and brokered it. Didn't have to write the check for, I think, 4.75. And uh, that was to a client in, um, well, Italy, Switzerland, and he still has it today. Um, and he doesn't have any interest in selling. <laughs> hey, if I had that car, I wouldn't want to sell. You know, I suddenly, eh. I, there's times I wish I had just kept one car every two or three years. You know, a California Spider here, an SLED there. <laughs> yeah, the you time, imagine? At the, you know, the, the 340 that I drove at Monterey in 1986, I paid 150 grand for it, which and was it, a lot of money. Wasn't that, okay, so the other... One of the other cars you raced the Millimilia in, it had the license plate, one the 51 Yeah, that was, MM. that was serial number 82. That was the 51 Millimilia winner. And that was a Vignali Coupe driven by uh, Gigi Villaresi. And because um, didn't all the Italians keep trying to steal the license plate yes. off of it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'd forgotten that. That's true. Yes. They, they, they thought the plate was wonderful. Yeah, because you know, it's a California plate, I 151 think, mm. I, I have it hanging on the wall. Yeah, I love I, it. I, you know, I have a bunch of the old license plates hanging on the wall. It's, yeah. I think I paid 250 for that car, 
and sold it for 500 and thought I was a genius. <laughs> well, hey, course, at, at the time, though, you a, were. Yeah, the 250,000, so. you know, bought a house. Yeah. You know, and now the same house is 750 and the same car is, yeah, 7 million. You know, a, a, a million million winners worth well over five. Yeah. Which, we're, you know, we're talking telephone book kind of numbers, but that's the reality today. Crazy as it is, yeah. You know, but things with history will always attract buyers. You know, it's that, not just a car, it's the story that goes with it. Yeah, that I have to agree. The best of the best will always... Yeah, it's like, you know, paintings. A Picasso isn't worth so much because of the squiggly lines. It's because <laughs> of the history behind it. Yeah, the name, the panache. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I mean, but there's, there's that thing to human history that people want to, and I think should, hold on to. And it, it makes it worthwhile. No, speaking, going back to the whole racing thing, I think what was really great is that I started in the formula cars and then went from formula cars, which are very precise and have aerodynamics and so forth, to uh, uh, G, uh, SECA GT1 cars, so Corvettes and Camaros with you know, 600 horsepower mm -hmm. and, and way more uh, power than, than tire. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those you drove like a, mm -hmm. like a dirt car. I mean... You know, your tail was hung out all the time. So that was a completely different uh, driving technique. And then when I went to Camel Light back, you know, you had ground effects again. You know, in theory, they can drive upside down at 150 miles an hour. So running, <laughs> running a Camel Light car at, say, Daytona or Sebring at night in the rain is very different than driving a Formula One car in a, or a Formula car on a, you know, bright and sunny day. Yeah. But... You know, you, you have to learn all the different driving so techniques. So that one, Sebring at night in the rain, was that the one where your windshield wouldn't defrost properly? That was the fab car. That would have been 1993, and it was a Porsche fab car. So it was a Porsche uh, Camel Light car, normally aspirated, uh, three liter. And um, it didn't have any defroster at all, and the wiper was worthless. So on the straight at Sebring, the straight is banked, and it was just torrential, torrential rain. The, the race was eventually uh, red flagged. Uh, but um, what I would do is I'd come around the last corner, hit the straight, and then hold the steering wheel, you know, go up to fourth, then to fifth, hold the steering wheel and push the right door open, which would let air in, which would clear the windshield so that I could see and and the rain was so bad and the but whiteout. Well, hold, hold, I think you're missing a part of that. Oh yeah, I am. It's yeah, more than that. You wouldn't you unplug your headset? Well, there's a switch to talk. Yeah. On the steering wheel, so uh, normally or a push button, you push to talk. And what I would do is not push to talk. And once I'd open the the door to clear the windshield, I then hold the steering wheel and start pounding it with one hand, screaming, you're going to die. You're going to die because you're accelerating around the last corner, coming down the front straight. It's banked. It's a torrential rain. So if you go off to the right or left, you're going to aquaplane into nothing. You have no choice. When you pass the pit out wall on the right, you count one, two, three, four, and you turn to set up for turn one. And, you know, you're, you're, you're in fourth gear or, or going into fifth gear there, you know, making a left turn, hoping there's a, you're, you've missed the wall. <laughs> yeah, it, it, hoping, you, know. hoping you didn't count wrong. Right. Get a little it, it excited was, with your count. It was terrifying. Count. You know, fortunately, the, the, the race uh, was red flagged when I was in the car and we stopped. But, like, for instance, a friend of mine, Dennis Ozzy, was running in a uh, uh, P car in front of me, and he aquaplaned. As I went around the corner, I could see he'd stuffed it right into the tires. And, he, you know, he was a very good driver. Uh, there was a lot of crashes that year. I drove, the fab car was uh, sponsored by ZZ Top, the band. Mm -hmm. So I drove for ZZ Top at Daytona in 93. We finished fourth in class. Then Sebring, we finished fourth in class. And then Atlanta, where we finished fourth in class. And uh, we were continually passed by the Mazda mm -hmm. uh, in the endurance races and the Spice in the short races. So uh, I switched to the Jim Downing team uh, with the Mazda Kudzu after Atlanta. Our first race was Sebring, and we finished second. And we finished out the season with 
uh, Jim Downing, and uh, every race was either third or second uh, with one DNF at uh, Laguna Seca when the tranny took a, a dump. See, you, uh, you got me into racing at a very young age. <laughs> um, I actually found out recently, so that photo uh, that I posted, I think for Father's Day on my Instagram, uh, was Father's Day? Something. But it was you holding me as like a, a newborn baby uh, yeah, wearing about, your race suit. About four days old. Yeah. And I didn't know this. I'd seen the photos before, but I didn't know the story. So basically, um, me and my brother were born and you were there and then you went racing while, you know, and then my mom on the way home from the hospital went stopped, by Willow Springs because you Willow were born Springs. in Ridgecrest. Yeah. And Ridgecrest is arguably not that far from Willow Springs. Arguably. So anyway, uh, she brought you guys by and there's a picture of me and the transporter holding you. So <laughs> long before I ever went home, I was at a racetrack. My first stop as a newborn child was at a racetrack. At Willow Springs. <laughs> at Willow Springs. And your dad, the back of your dad's transporter. Yep. And I think <laughs> I was driving um, uh, the Cheetah Spider. There was, the Cheetah was a famous race car built in How many race cars do you think you've had? Oh, hundreds. Hundreds. And how many have I raced? A hundred. You know, think about it. Um, I was racing at least twice a month, plus testing, you know, racing in Japan, racing in Italy, um, from 86 to, well, as late as 206. You know, that's a lot of racing. And well, yeah, I put the, the um, picture frame together with a bunch of pictures I found of you and race cars, plus a bunch of your racing licenses all around. There must be 40 of them all around the edge of the frame and when i gave it to you you were like oh, i forgot about that car oh i forgot i did that race yeah. oh yeah i raced that yeah. <laughs> and we find the boxes of of uh of pictures and stuff and go through them a bit you go oh oh right that car yeah you know and so i think you've forgotten more than oh there's you know. no question yeah there's no question i mean you know, there's, there's too many no, to remember there's no it question all. i've done you know well over 100 races well, well over um, in just about everything from... Oh, no, I don't mean races. I mean how many cars. Oh, at least 100 cars. Yeah. You know, at least. What would happen was we'd sell cars to Japan, mm -hmm. and the Japanese would want to see the car at a racetrack. So, um, you know, I mean, everything from 206s to 906s to... Uh, I sold an Alpha Formula, Formula One... Uh, an Alpha Tipo 179, so a 1981 Alpha Formula One car, to Japan and took it to Fuji and you know ran it for the Japanese owner at Fuji. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a, it was kind of fun. There was um, a Porsche. There was a group of us, and uh, all the Japanese had Porsche 930 turbos. So they went out first, and uh, I, you know, went out maybe a minute later, and I caught them as they're on the front straight. So there's this flock of Porsche turbos going down the front straight at Fuji, which is really long. And I mean, I, I came up on them you know, 50 miles an hour faster. You know, I was probably doing 180. And I just went through them like a, you know, like <laughs> butter. And I think I scared the crap out of them. Probably. The, the Alpha, you know, I've, I've driven a lot of different Formula One cars. And probably the did you ever race the one that you took to Pebble where you did the 180? Uh, that was a, uh, a, a, a 500, uh, so a Ferrari F2 500, a four cylinder. And uh, yeah, we did take it to Pebble Beach. We drove it, up, drove it over the podium. But uh, no, I don't think I ever raced that one. Yeah, because the, the story is um, for the listeners uh, basically, he took the car to Pebble Beach. And, uh, well, the background is they had an open wheel 50s class, and it was all Indy cars. So I show up in this Ferrari Formula 2 car, so a four-cylinder Formula 2, 
Um, and there's, I think there was like half a dozen Indy cars, and they have perfect paint, and the chrome is perfect, and they're detailed, and they're wonderful, and you know, they were spectacular, and I thought, I'm toast. You know, <laughs> this is just, you know, an F, I, we, we detailed it, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> the Indy cars all had electric starts, front electric starts. Um, so as they were being judged, each guy plugged in the electric starter and, you know, they'd spray the methanol and they'd get them running and starting and all that stuff. When they came over to me, they said, can you start it? And I said, sure. Uh, so um, I was aimed downhill by chance. So I just said, give me a push. And I had a couple of guys. I hopped in it. You know, I'm wearing my little blue you know, blazer and my little button-down shirt. And the khaki shirt. And the, the khaki pants and the whole bit. Have to have the, yeah. the car show uh, <laughs> yeah, uniform. Car show, right. So I got a push down the hill. I'm yelling, move, move. And I got it down the hill at maybe 15 miles an hour down the, you know, slight hill. And I dropped the clutch and it started. And so I held it at about three grand, which was pretty spectacular. And, you know, and I kept waving everybody back. And then I just did a, a 180. I just, you know, revved the piss out of it, dropped the clutch, spun it 180, and then calmly drove it right back to the same spot, spun it 180 again, and <laughs> shut it off and said, yep, it runs. <laughs> so, oh, so I bet the judges oh, must have just, yeah, their they jaws just died, hit the, I'm sure. Yep. <laughs> you know, because they don't like big burn marks across the lawn no. or big gouges across the lawn. And, you know, I did it at both ends. So uh, I got a second or third in class. So I did the same thing. You know, I got, got a push drove up, got a push, drove up on the ramp, got my little trophy, put it down, and then just did a big burnout off the ramp and went back to my spot and shut it off. I mean, the audience m must have been thrilled, but yeah. the... You know, I was just think I hadn't thought about that car in 20 years, 30 years. I wonder what I sold that for. I probably paid, nobody cared, you know, 250 300 sold it for 350 or 400 And, and F2, F2 cars, four cylinders, like the one behind yeah, me. Yes, that engine. Yeah, because this one, we have another video, uh, a review video on this engine. So it should be out shortly after this podcast is. So keep an eye out for that video. But um, this one's a 500 Mondial engine. But the same basic thing, two liter, four cylinder Ferrari engine. And 1952, 53, that engine was good for 170 horsepower from uh, two liters, 120 cubic inches, which was... In 1952, 53, yeah, state of the bad. art, was enough for Ferrari to win the world championship. Yep. Can't get any better than that. Right. <laughs> and, you know, looking back in that F1 car or F2 car, wow, they're primitive. Solid rear axle, um, basically a non-adjustable front suspension, um, probably had some, you know, positive in the front and, you know, no caster. What's the most terrifying car you've raced? 375 F1. It was a 52-ish, uh, 375 F1 car, three four-barrel carburetors, and uh, <laughs> it had way more horsepower than handling, way more horsepower than brakes, way more, it was terrifying. Uh, the F2 car, I didn't race the F2 car, but the F2 car was at least, you know, a decent balance of power to brakes to, to weight. Um, yeah, I've driven enough cars, just the normal stuff we get that are underbraked and overpowered. Or, you know, I mean, overpowered for how much brake there is. And that alone is terrifying just on the street, let alone on a track. And once the brakes get hot, then they're even less usable. You know, speaking of quality and what's the best, um, the scariest sort of GT production race car I drove was probably the Cheetah Spider, which you just drove it sideways. It was t it had way too much power and the whole chassis flexed. But you know, I did a one race with it and won. So at Willow Springs, so that was fun. Um, it had you know, it was terrifying. Um, probably the best uh, car I've ever driven overall was the Alpha Formula One because it was a full ground effects car. Um, and uh, like at, at um, Fuji, you'd come around the last corner in fourth or fifth, and as you'd crest the hill, the car would get light and just drift out beautifully to the wall. you keep your foot in it, and you'd go probably fifth. It was a six-speed, so fifth and then sixth. And, you know, just as you reached 
well, 10,000 RPM plus in six speed at the end of the, in sixth gear at the end of the straight, then it was time to brake again. That was a wonderful car. The best prototype I ever drove was the Kudzu uh, in 93. Uh, I drove it for well, probably 10 races in the season, and it was a perfectly balanced car. Um, so there's been some good cars. The best vintage car, of course, was Lulubel, the Tetsu Rosa. That was. So you got me racing. <clears throat> Basically, you had me and my brother, you know, twins, and I remember. Well, we were, I stuck you guys in go-karts when you were about four. Yeah, but even, yeah, you had those little carts that, that <laughs> yeah. you'd ride your bike and we're just all over the place. And yeah, there were a little, a little electric formula Ferraris. <laughs> you know, I, I gave them away. That's too bad. They're, they they'd be they would be so cute. They'd be cute to have today. Yeah, well, I gave them away. Anyway, there were little, you know, kids, Formula One, Ferrari, plastic things with electric motors and batteries. And... Uh, you know, uh, I could keep up with them, you know, back then I could run for miles. <laughs> so I could keep up with them, you know, just jogging along with you guys. Uh, and from there you went to uh, go-karts when you were like four. Um, and, you know, the first go-karts you had, I mean, I could literally, you know, run up alongside and, you know, <laughs> go this way. Right, yeah. Brakes on the left, don't hit your sister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't run into your sister. Don't hit your brother. Yep. <laughs> Stop! Please. <laughs> anyway. I remember the first time I ever passed you, too. Oh, that yeah. Was, wow, I forgot about yeah, that. that. Yeah, that was hilarious <laughs> because from my point of view, <clears throat> I finally caught up to you, and I took you on the inside, and you looked over and looked back and did a double take, like, her, because <laughs> we were racing with other people. Right. And, uh, and so you got that, like, no. <laughs> and you just, I think you actually stuffed me into the wall. I, I honestly don't remember, but I do remember that. Or was, I think you at least bumped me or something, because we um, are a tad bit competitive, <laughs> maybe just a little. Yeah. And so there's been um, more than once where uh, one of us has ended up in the tire wall. This is true. This is true. <laughs> Although I look back and I think about all the tire. I, you know, I didn't end up in the tire wall that much. Like once at Road Atlanta, I parked a Camaro on top of the tire wall. It's a little more forgiving in go-karts. Yeah. So, you know, that, especially when they're rental rides, it's not, um, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's not what you should be doing, but I mean, you know, tempers flare and somebody ends up in the tire wall. It happens. The, it's called the red mist. <laughs> the red mist descends and you, you know, you become obsessed with, I'm going to late break them. Yep. <laughs> or I can do oh, this. Speaking of, um, so you were telling me. I've heard the story. You were in, oh, what was it? Okay, so you were using these cars, I think rabbits or something, because they were, <laughs> <laughs> that was, they were wow, your brakes. I forgot about that. That was the Firehawk series. I raced the Firehawk series in, I guess, 88-ish. The Firehawk series was an endurance series. Uh, the big race in the Firehawks was the 24 hours of Watkins Glen. Mm -hmm. And it was a 24-hour race in what was essentially, supposedly, showroom stock cars, but they weren't. They, you know, they were bodies in white. So, for instance, I drove for a team, boy, I, where'd that come from? I, uh, a team named Skip Pipes Racing. And we were the, the number two team uh, in, with the Chevys, after, with the Camaros, after the, uh, there was a, a factory-backed Chevy team. So they had the blue Camaros and we had white Camaros, and uh, I did two, three, 24-hour uh, races in those things at Watkins Glen, which was great fun. I anyway, bet. we were, I was racing, I was racing with Skip Pipes at Portland, and there was a rabbit, a Volkswagen rabbit in a different class that was blocking me. So I just dropped back in a corner and then I came up and I punted him <laughs> out of the way. Uh, you would never. <laughs> he was slowing me down. He was blocking me. <laughs> you know, through the, at the end of the straight at Portland, you go around a big sweeper and then there's some messes for the back straight. Anyway, he was in the way and I punted him out of the way. And I got a call over the radio that, uh, that the IMSA wasn't too happy with me. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, they, they, they said I punted them on purpose, which, of course, I didn't do. It was purely Never. accidental. You know, I just came up on them too fast. But anyway. 
So there's no correlation between how much money you spend in racing and how much fun you have. When um, when I was well younger, said. you're stealing my lines. Uh, yeah, yeah. I you know learn from the best. Uh, when I was younger, you know, starting in the go karts, and then we advanced to a lot of oval track racing. Yes. And um, nice thing about that, even here in California, you have oval tracks. I mean, it's a lot more common. Um, in the middle of the country, but... Um, yeah, but ours are paved. Those are dirt. Yes. Although the dirt is fun. <laughs> I, you know, just sideways the whole time. But um, we did legend cars together, and that was, that was a blast. And it's a giant learning experience, too. I mean, everything... Uh, all the different kinds of racing. I like I like circuit track, oval track. We even did the the drifting carts. Um, you know, I mean, we've and and it's all so different. You know, I mean, like drifting. It's uh, not the fastest way to get around a track. You know, usually, <laughs> but, it's spectacular. but it's and it's a lot of fun and and it's a whole different skill of handling and. So, um, stuff like that, like for Christmas, I think last year I got, uh, you and me and then my, um, husband and his dad, uh, the, the stock car yeah. things. Late models at, at Irwindale. Yeah. And we, we got lessons or lap time or whatever, whatever. seat time. Um, but that was a lot of fun too. And we hadn't been on that track because it was at Irwindale where we used to do the legend cars and stock cars. And so we hadn't been there in years. So getting back out there was fun. Well, I had, as you know, all too well, I had prostate cancer. When you have prostate cancer, you get cut open like a fish. So, you know, you're on hold for a few years. Then my wife had lung cancer. Then my cancer came back. So we've had to put racing on hold for a long time, but hopefully we will be back running again in the next 30, 60 days, uh, we just have to decide, you know, where we want to start. And when you've been gone for uh, too many years, you start out with go-karts or something, just, to, you know, to get some track get time in. in and have some fun and, yeah. you know, not spend too much money, and then you decide where you want to go. Yeah, because, I mean, we still own three race cars. Uh, yeah. The, you know, both Ferraris plus the Lamborghini. There's the Lamborghini GC3 car, which Which we... I love. <laughs> I just love it. <laughs> I... Personally, I don't know what it is. I'd rather have a 360 challenge. There's something about the Ferrari. I, I don't know. I just, I mean, we're also Ferraris online, so something like, it, it, it just appeals to me more. Even though the Lambo is more powerful and faster and it would whoop the challenge car's ass, I don't know. I just, I like well, the What I like about the Lamborghini is it's a real serious GT3 car. It is. And, you know, so it'll, it'll run 24 hours. It'll run a whole year with nothing but brakes and, you know, the occasional clutch and lots of services. Uh, so they're, they're very And there's lots of places to race it, too. Yes. You know, those cars, uh, the GT3 cars, basically, they are stock Lamborghini Gallardos with some adjustments to, of course, the body and, uh, they're, well, not they're, some... They're, yeah, they're, they're a body in white, which means they're the basic Gallardo body shell with a carbon fiber front fenders, carbon yep. fiber nose. Uh, you know, Add the roll cage, village. strip out the interior. I mean, basically, your your adjustments are suspension and wing. Um, yeah, but what it also has is it has a full splitter on the front. Uh, yeah. It has the, the you know the the little more and more aerodynamics. Yeah. But you know that's the nice thing about having a, a a mostly stock engine is parts are readily available, um, and it's it's not that horribly expensive to race. I mean, you know, compared to go-karts, it's, yeah. you know. Astronomical. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. compared to racing Ferraris. A set of tires will do a lot of, a lot of go-kart hours. <laughs> yeah, but you know, the, the Lamborghini is out of our race cars, the cheapest one to race. And then we get into the Ferraris and the Boxer and the 308 are both, I mean, I remember we were at Elkhart Lake, and we were going around, I think, in your Daytona. It was my comp Daytona. One of my comp Daytona. Yeah, and I'm in the passenger seat, and all of a sudden, just water just across the windshield. I'm like, what's going on? And then some steam, and then you pulling off to the side. And You know, I was younger. I was just like, because I, I, I didn't race Ferraris, so I wasn't used to stuff blowing up. 
um, you know, go-karts, legend cars, all the stuff that I raced. They never blow up. They, yeah, they, you, you really got to try to make them now, explode. legend cars, you sometimes find yourself flying through the air. Yes. I remember, yeah, I had, there was that photo of that guy who like went almost over the top of me. And then there was the other guy on our team who spun out, hit the wall so hard he caught on fire. I'd forgotten that, yeah. Yeah, because there's only been a couple times where they actually red flag the track in legend cars. Usually you just slow down, keep your spot and keep going. But, you know, having somebody on fire, because there's so, in my division, you know, as, as a teenager, and the only <laughs> well, girl. you're thinking it, of the nationals we did. Yeah, well, a, a lot of the races. I mean, when you got, you know, 20 or 30, 14 to 16 year old boys and me uh, on a track, and nobody wants to lose, and you're 14, so dad's you're not, writing the check and paying for everything. So, so dad's writing the check, and you're not really worried about getting hurt because what's that? You're invincible. You know, yeah, absolutely. You'll, nothing bad will ever happen to you. So it's you know you're gonna win or <laughs> you go out you're in a spectacular ball of so flame. <laughs> at the uh, at the Legend Car Nationals, which was in Phoenix that year. Uh, you were in the, whatever it was called, Young Lions or the Kamikazes or whatever the class <laughs> That's was. That's more like it. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, and you guys never completed a lap. Ah! Never. No, 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 <laughs> no. The, the flag would drop and there'd be a crash. And you'd do it all over again. I, I, you and the car behind you were playing bumper car all the way and she, it was another girl. I know, there, I had, I think one or two other girls I raced against in that season, but for the most part, there weren't other girls out there occasionally. But at the Nationals, there was a girl behind you who was determined to get past. And, you know, every time there'd be, you'd slow for a corner. Anyway, bottom line is you never, you guys never completed a lap. And then I was in the over 60 set, um, and over 50 at the time. And, um, <laughs> you know, we all qualified and we all started the race and we all went around and there was no It was like a little and, parade. Yeah. And, you know, and <laughs> a high-speed parade. Yeah, everybody, you know, started and finished where they qualified. Yeah. And there was, I think, one guy passed me towards the end. That was it, you know. Was it? And one of those times I remember you lost a tire. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. In qualifying... It's never good when your tire passes you on the track. <laughs> yeah, uh, at, that was, again, at the Nationals, national end-of-the-year race at Phoenix, uh, uh, Vegas, Vegas. And uh, my tire passed me in qualifying, and that kind of freaked me out and screwed up my qualifying. You know, you, it's never good when your left front falls off yeah. in an oval car because yeah. your left front's rather important. Just a little. Yeah, it came off. Actually, it came off in what would be turn three. Is in the, in the middle of the corner, it suddenly went one way, and, you know, fortunately, the car dropped to the ground and, you know, and it's a legend car, so yeah, it's so not it's exactly that the way. Yeah. Well, because <laughs> well, I remember the the cool like uh, the cool thing. I loved. Uh, I mean, it was sad because somebody crashed, but I loved that they'd come in with a little crane, basically a little hook or claw, and it would pick it up by the roof yep. and just kind of like carry it on out of there. You know, a tow truck with a claw, yep. and it was just it would be so cute because they're little cars. They're you know they reminded me of kind of like shrunken PT cruisers, <laughs> um, and yeah, so you just. Have the claw come and drag it away and yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's a whole, se what could a whole season of legend cars cost? Well, a car is worth 12,000 bucks uh, for a really good car. And <clears throat> you'd be hard pressed to spend, you know, 500 bucks a race. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you were really crazy and, you know, you had a whole crew and so forth and, you know, you might be able to spend a thousand bucks a race. <clears throat> and, you know, um, when we were running, too, there was more tracks. For instance, there was a track in San Bernardino that's closed. Orange uh, Show, right? Yeah, Orange Show. It closed. Yeah. That, was, that one was really banked. That yeah, one, that yeah. was a good one. That was a good one. I like that. Okay, so my first time in this car, in this legend car, because my dad likes to, um, basically, it's kind of like throw her in the deep end and hang out and see if, you know, she sinks or swims, and if the bubbles stop, then you might want to rescue her. Uh, That's true. So, first time I ever get in this legend car, uh, it's at the Nationals in Las Vegas 
on a circuit track. It's a different, different track. That's on a, yeah, that was a road race track. Yeah, yeah. And um, legend cars are, they're, they're oval track cars, so they are made to go left. So when you are driving in a straight line and you let go of the steering wheel, the car goes left. So it's just, it's not set up for road racing, but. Well, it can be set up somewhat. It, it, but. Somewhat, but it's off, everything is offset. So, you know, you, you try and modify it a bit, but there's only so much you can do. You yeah, know? and the problem with the, the road circuit at Vegas is that it's, you know, it's a right-hand circuit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we get there, and we have the little crew that has the cars, and you go, all right, this is your car. There's the parking lot. Go figure it out. <laughs> and, you know, it was a sequential gearbox, so it was a little different from what I was used to. I mean, shifter carts have the paddles and, you know, and, and I, um, I think at that point you had taught me how to, oh yeah, I had driven like the BMW, some stuff with, um, normal, you know, gearboxes, nothing sequential. How old so. were you, about 14? Yeah, I think so. I think you actually might have gotten me in early at 13. I don't remember. I don't, yeah, but... Um, cause there was the bandoleros before that. Mm, yeah. I'd forgotten something else. I forgot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we tried all kinds of stuff, but, um, there was only so much I was allowed to race at that time when I, you know, under 16, you're kind of limited. Well, um, if we'd been in the Midwest, it would have been stuffer in a, you know, late model with, you know, 500 horsepower. Yeah. Well, no, I wasn't allowed in the late model until I turned 16. Actually, I think we did some test days when I was 15. But and, and, I would, and they weren't very happy about it. Yeah, yeah. But they wouldn't let me race. They would only let me do the test days. Um, but, you know, I think we had just been to the track so much, they were kind of like, oh, fine, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so I, I, my first time in, in the Legend car was uh, testing out in the parking lot. I'm like, all right, I think I kind of understand what to do. And I gotta say, I was kind of proud of myself because not only did I finish the race, which when it's your first time in a car and it was the national, so every there, everyone there was and you're, and you're dead in, serious. And you're in a class of mostly boys. Uh, there had to be 40 cars in your group. It was huge. And uh, you know, they're all what, 14, 15, you know, yeah. so under 16. So they're so, fearless. Oh, uh, they're nuts. Yeah. They're nuts. And, but I was so proud of myself because not only did I finish, you know, I didn't crash, I didn't embarrass myself, but I also didn't finish last. I think there was two people behind me. Which, you know, I mean, luckily I got better after that, but like first, uh, first time, you know, and yeah, that's, on a track that's never about been as to good as it, it gets. Yeah, yeah. On a car you, in a car you'd never been in before, at a track you've never been to before. Yeah, in a car that's not really made for that track. Yeah. In the nationals where everyone's just dying to win, yeah, they were nuts. Yeah, but, you know, it was, uh, I think it was a great first experience because it's kind of like, all right, you know, this is what it's all about. Yeah. If, if you're going to do it, then here, go do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is the deep end. Have fun. Yeah. But, and, you know. And, you know, if the bubbles stop, I will pull you out. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. 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 No, I think, you know, that's, that's where we get back into it is the... Car. And there's so many different schools, too, racing schools to do. Um, I mean, you know, we've been talking about it a lot recently because it's something we're planning on doing. But Because yeah, nobody has cancer and nobody has any problems. Yeah, thank God. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, I mean, you know, just hearing all your stories uh, growing up, there's so many different things that have instilled a love of cars in me. And racing is definitely one of them. Going to shows with you is another. I mean, like the time that. So, you dragged me to all kinds of, of races. And that's where I, I saw. A, a, so, I was at a, a Ferrari meet, some kind of Ferrari race. And there was a car that I oh, saw. Oh, that was at uh, Fontana. That was a Ferrari uh, historic race. Yeah. That and I saw this car, I was, I don't know, 10? Yeah, 10, 12. And I saw this car, and I'm like, ooh, that's a pretty car. I just, it, it, it caught my eye. And I go up to it, I'm looking at it, and the owner goes, oh, would you like it? I'm like, yeah, it's cool. And um, guy walks away. My dad comes up to me and goes, do you know who that is? Nope. 
Do you know what car that is? No. Yeah, I know this. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was um, John, John Shirley, Shirley and, and 250 GTO. That's his 250 GTO. And Series 2. Yeah. Uh, which even, now belongs to Harry Yegi. Ah, uh, yes. Even at a young age, I had expensive taste. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, of course, I have to find the most expensive car in existence. Yep. But, yeah. And as you and I were liking, loving the 250 GTO and the 206 SP, I don't remember who had that there. Um, and I had a Daytona, uh, my comp Daytona. Um, your brother was off in the corner, you know, bored out of his mind. I think he was playing on his Nintendo. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you had us both racing, and, and it's just, he really is not interested in the cars. No, not at all. Yeah. You know, I, and, I, and he's not competitive. And if you're not competitive, you're, you're not going to enjoy racing, and you're not going to be good at it. Yeah, that's the thing, is it's, it's funny, because you always described racing as hours of boredom mixed with moments of sheer terror. Um, and it's very true. I mean, you know, it, it's, it, you're, you're pushing yourself to the absolute limit of not only what the car will do, but what you can mentally wrap your brain around. Cause when you're coming into corners and there's walls and I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's well, so much one fun. One of the <laughs> things that, that I've tried to in, instill in you very early in the game is that, um, you know, <laughs> Carol Smith had a wonderful saying. You know, tune your chassis, gain 50 horsepower. Um, in any car, how you set the car up is far more important. Um, well, it's far more important than trying to wing out, uh, you know, an extra 20 horsepower. Um, and I think the first lesson, real lesson, you had in that was the a legend car. The air pressure, yeah. Yeah, explain, pressure. explain that story. Oh. Um, so when I, that morning when I first went out on the track. Well, that, that was a completely, no, that was, that was much later at, uh, Irwindale. We went yeah. through that. Yeah. Yeah. Because you'd done the ovals. You already had done the ovals, but you, you know, you'd never played with any suspension or, or, uh, No, I know. That, that day at Irwindale, when I first went out on the track, um, I do some laps and I was real loose. You know, the car just wanted to slide up to the wall. And Which is what they do. Yeah. Um, and I think, didn't we add, God, I forgot exactly, we added a Well, what pound. happened is I, I sat down with the crew chief and I said, she needs to understand how little tiny changes in, in suspension dynamics will change the handling of the car. And you had the deer in the headlight look about, what are you talking about? Well, so, I think I was 13 or so. Yeah. So what we did is we simply changed the right front tire pressure by one pound. And the difference is that the tire with one pound more pressure stands up a little straighter, and so you have a slightly better contact patch, but it absorbs more heat, mm -hmm. so, and then goes off faster because they're basically, a, they are a street tire. So what happens when you add one pound of pressure is that for the first half a dozen laps, you suddenly feel like, you know, Fangio, suddenly you're, you're rocking and rolling, you're, you know, you're passing guys that you qualified behind, and then the heat builds up and it goes off and suddenly you're heading for the wall again. So, yeah. you know, explain what happened. Oh, well, I, I was shocked by the difference. Uh, One pound. Yeah, it's, it's all, well, so you always told me the story about uh, the, what car was it? Something you were racing where you changed the toe in and <laughs> the camber. Yeah. And you went from dead last to third. Third. The car was a 750 Monza, and I had bought it. It had been rebuilt and restored in England, but it was stock suspension settings. So it had no caster. It had positive camber in the front. Uh, it had tow out in the back. And it had, it not only was it towed out in the back, but it had positive in the back. And um, it was just, Horrible, 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 horrible. I uh, bought the car uh, in Europe, had it trucked to um, the Copa d'Italia, and at the first corner on the first lap, I launched at some hill climb in Italy, I came into the first corner and, you know, first corner, first lap in a car I had just bought, never sat in before, never seen before. So I started uh, trail braking in the corner and nothing happened. 
So I trail brake a little harder. You know, I'm, I'm braking way too early, just, you know, filling the car out. Nothing happens. So I, you know, start to run out of road. I, you know, put on the brakes hard and then swapped ends on me. And so I had to drive that horrible car all the way through the Copa d'Italia, which is like 10 races. It was horrible. Um, <clears throat> when I came back to California, it went straight to Monterey. I ran it at Monterey, and uh, I was dead last. It was horrible. So um, after Monterey, we... Was that when you told your crew chief... That what? was a different time. You're thinking of the Camaro and the Springs at Laguna Seca? Yeah. Yeah. That was, so what we did is everything's fixed in that car. So it has a DD on rear end. There's no adjustment. So we took the rear end out and we sent it to a truck stop that does truck front axles. And they gave it a little bit of toe in, probably a quarter of an inch, which is a lot of toe in. On each side in the back, they gave it about mm, probably a lot, like five degrees of negative. And then on the front, we offset the bushing so it had a little bit of caster, gave it a little bit of negative in the front. Um, and we also uh, put some baffles in the oil pan, and I went from dead last the year before to third. And uh, there were two cars that beat me for the next few years. One was a C-Type, which had disc brakes, and the other was a Jaguar Special of some kind, which had disc brakes. And while I could keep up with them, I couldn't catch them under braking. They both could brake later than I could, and, you know, the Monza had horrible old drum brakes. You know, today I'd put, you know, carbon fiber lining on it and say, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but whatever. Anyway, um, the time you're thinking about, I was running a, uh, an IMSA GTO Camaro, so about 625 horsepower. Was that Porky? Porky, about 2,700 pounds. Um, it was a Weaver tranny. It was, uh, we built the engines. Uh, the body was, I forget who built it, it's too many years. But I ran it in Trans Am and, and GTO. And two things. At Willow, if we ran the Trans Am rear wheel, which was like a 12-inch tire with a 12-inch wheel, um, it would turn 127s. And with the GTO wheel, which again by memory was a 13-inch wheel with the same tire, it would run 126s. And the reason is, by, move, by taking the tire and doing this with it, you stiffen it up. Mm -hmm. And so just adding an inch of wheel to the back was good for one second every lap. And uh, running at Willow, we ran a 600-pound front spring in the car uh, because Willow is just basically a giant oval, and you're trying not to get your car to flop over. So it's basically a giant oval with a couple of wiggly bits at the top end, um, you know, which are sacrificial. It's all about how quick you can go through, you know, seven, eight, through turn one and two. Um, we took the same car to Laguna Seca. My crew chief didn't make any changes to it. So on the first lap, uh, I, I, you know, go out and I start my hop, hot lap, come over the hill, I start braking and nothing happens. So I brake harder and nothing happens. So I brake harder and it swapped ends on me. And I said, you know, so I immediately came in and said, this isn't working. And uh, <clears throat> we went from a 600 pound front spring to a 300 pound front spring. And that allows the front end to dip down. And, yeah, and but he didn't. Oh, yeah. So I come in and I said, we have to change the front springs. It's way too stiff. And my crew chief, we had a Beaver motorhome, and uh, Sammy, my crew chief, said, I think I'm going to go in the motorhome and smoke a joint and think about it. And I realized, <laughs> well, you're done, dude. Yeah, you didn't know. need a new crew chief. Yeah, I, new crew chief needed. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I mean, that's just such basic stuff that it's like, Come on, Stoney. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> this, is, this is not rocket science if you're a crew chief. When I was running at Daytona, I had bought a uh, Canepa transporter, which back then was a 40-foot transporter with a new Kenworth. Um, and um, whatever the last race of the year was, you know, the racing season was done. The transporter was sitting there, and you know, the first race of the year was Daytona, so it was three or four months away. And I remember my crew chief then, different crew chief, said, we need to hire the driver from the Dan Gurney team because he's been laid off. 
I said, yeah, he got laid off. The season's over. He says, well, we should hire him. And I said, we don't need him till Daytona. And he said, I'll never forget this. He said, you rich guys are all alike. You make your money by not paying your people fairly. And I stopped and I said, hold it. His name was Craig Campbell. And I said, let me write this down. Didn't you make a plaque? And I have a plaque. And that, that plaque, I hope that plaque is in the office I, No, I think, I, think it's, yeah. I think I've seen it. You rich guys are all alike. You make your money by not paying your people properly. He wanted me to hire a truck driver for four months to sit on his ass and wait for the racing season to start. And you're the bad person because you the wouldn't bad do guy. that. Yeah. Yeah. When you stopped racing, um, was so now you're 71. And we haven't raced in a few years, quite a few years. Um, and the good I've, news. And I've had my most recent cornea transplant. And it was and successful. And I've had my cataract surgery done. And so now my vision is now 2020 again. Yeah. Yeah, because that, that was one of the big things is because uh, your vision, uh, you can't race if you can't see. Well, I, w- I went legally blind the first time in 82. Yeah. In one eye. And, and then you had surgery, and it worked for a while, but then you needed another surgery. Then I had to have yeah, another cornea transplant. Yeah. And the drugs you take during a cornea transplant toast your cataracts. So I, I, you know, after the cornea transplant, I could see, and then six months later, I was blind again because the cataracts were toasted, and then I had the cataracts. Big brain damage. Yeah. Yeah, being, you, you don't realize how important your sight is until you go blind a couple of times. Yeah. Well, at 71, um, and in good health, thank goodness. At the then, moment. At the moment, for now. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's become one of those, we really need to get back on the track. Well, you know, you know it's a, <laughs> this car is from, well, the owner of this car has dementia. The owner of that car just had a heart attack today. So um, some of our clients are getting on in age. Yeah. And you realize that if you don't do this today, you're not going to do it ever. Yeah, you may not. Yeah, you know, although we have clients in their 80s who are still, oh, yeah. you know, buying lots of cars. And, yep. and I, I love it because it's like, I don't know. That's, I think it's awesome, you know? Like, follow your dreams. Yeah. And if you love cars... Don't let it ever stop. You know, I mean, but we do have clients who've had knee surgeries and, and just can't. Sh- uh, some of them have decided to uh, buy paddle shift cars because they just can't not have something fun. Um, but, you know, we've sold a lot of cars because people just can't drive them anymore. Yes. You know, they have some health issue where they can't drive a stick. And... Uh, yeah, it's knee surgery, it's prostate cancer, it's hip surgery, yeah. it's their wife had breast cancer. Yeah, something. Yeah, we did a lot of that. I just, uh, we've got all the Kinetti parts, like this engine we're about to sell. And uh, I was trying to trace down one of the owners, and I just found out tonight that he died. So the last owner, Will Heibel, died about two weeks ago, and the owner before that, Bob Taylor, died a few years ago. Yes. Yes. So well, life is short. Indeed. No, but you know, we're, it's, it's something, getting back to racing is something that we're definitely going to be doing very soon and we'll video a lot of it because, I mean, that's the nice, uh, one of the perks of our job is racing is... Um, With pre-tax dollars. Yeah, it's, it's a write-off, so <laughs> we, we get to, we get to um, follow our passion and because it's part of our job, it... it Works real well for us. Uh, it, I, I started racing, you know, way before time in the 70s, and I, I remember coming out of Turn Nine at Riverside, back about wow, 77 maybe, uh, in my Comp Daytona, and as I come blasting out of Turn Nine, you aim at the uh, back then, you know, it had been. We hadn't gone racing in six months because of the end of the season and rain. And so I come blasting out of the first, first club race of the, of the year, and you aim at the, the flag stand. You know, you come out of nine, you aim at the flag stand, you make it left, and that sets you up for turn one. And as I come out of turn nine, I realized I can't see the flag stand. Oof. So that's the first time I stopped. You know, so there's been a lot of stops, starts, stops, starts. Yeah. 
And yeah. back then, getting a cornea transplant took years. Yeah. You know. Some of the big car shows we go to, too, have all the races. Um, you know, Monterey, well, Monterey car. Monterey, Monterey, for instance, first became important in 1974 when Steve Earle started the races. Initially, yeah. there was the Pebble Beach Concourse, which was a very low-key, you know, 300 So what came people. first, the concourse or the races? Oh, Pebble Beach has been around since. So the, the, it was the concourse and the races helped make the concourse big. Right, and then the auction started. Yes. So it was, and now it's its own little entity. It's it's grown a life of its own and does its except own. Except we know. now have COVID nineteen. Yeah. And, um, but people are still trying to make something happen this year. It's kind of interesting. And you know, Don't I we, haven't I haven't had time to check because the races were on, but they may have been canceled. And yeah. I meant to go online. I think it was at uh, Laguna Seca where I saw a three 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 SP. Um, and it has all the tire warmers, and, and they're, they're a trip to see. But uh, speaking of, so we have the, the nose for sale right now. And, you know, some of the nifty parts that we've gotten on consignment recently, they all showed up at once, which is kind of cool. I mean, all, most of them came from one place and then this nose from another. But um, when, I, when I was younger, one time, we had a 333 SP in the garage. <laughs> I'd forgotten, yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> And so my dad one day, I think you were showing off to your girlfriend or something, because Leia was there, the daughter. Mm -hmm. She was my friend. You were like, oh, watch this. And you set me on the car, and you're like, look, it's a slide. And I'm sliding down it. And, uh, I mean, they're pretty indestructible, especially to, you know, or whatever, eight. Seven. Eight. Yeah. And, um, you know, so. I, With your shoes off. I made you take your shoes well, off. Oh, yes. Um, I think I have photos somewhere. I'll. If I can dig them up, I'll put them across the screen. But Well, you've forgotten. I used to take you to school in a uh, McLaren F1. Yeah. An orange, a candy orange McLaren F1. Yeah, no, I, I remember that because that car stuck out in my mind because it just, the candy orange and the three seats and the sounds it makes, it was just such a cool car. Yeah, and because I had twins, I had one on each side. So I'm in the center seat. Mm -hmm. I have one of you each on each side and you went to different schools so i take you to your school you'd open the door you'd get out and of course you know the, the other parents day. must have just had a good laugh because some days we'd show up in a mclaren f1 and some days we'd show up in a 1930 bmw yeah or, or whatever <laughs> it was you know mood. one is a uh, high speed okay i'm late to school and the next one's like well you better leave an hour early <laughs> there was one time where we had three McLaren F1 cars at the house in the garage. I don't remember that. Yeah, and uh, we were loading one into a truck, and some guy came by, and he went, Oh, my God. One, two. Wow. Yeah. Three. Yeah. Remember the one we saw at Pebble Beach in 2014? I look over, and I see it. I'm like, what the hell? Because it was a white one, but it was filthy filthy and somebody had obviously driven their mclaren f1 and you know at 2014 they were probably what 15 no 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 it was a 800,000 million dollar car at the time no, no no it was a lot more than that in 2015 oh 15 no that was richard power's car and i don't think it was 215 i think it was i i don't remember what it was, it was 214 because we were working at rick cole because it was right in front of the marriott where he okay. was and that was richard power's car and, but it was and that car had Costa Rica license plates. Okay, yeah, because it cracked me up because it was it was just covered in dust and bugs and and it was parked and, in the handicapped parking. Yeah, and I thought it was hilarious because it was like, eh, I can uh, have a fifteen million dollar car and not detail it because, eh, I can, yeah. <laughs> you know, it just it, uh, it just that's one of the amazing things about Monterey Car Week is uh, you'll be walking around and and come across some of the wildest cars but i think that's where we'll wrap it up today um we there's so many stories so maybe next time we can do one on different car shows because that alone <laughs> is its own little world i mean we've worked at auctions we've you know you judged a couple you've been a judge at different car shows you you've been going to car shows since they became a thing. <laughs> uh, since the early 70s. Yeah, so uh, we'll do another episode all on that. But uh, that's all for today. And I hope you guys enjoy hearing these stories. Uh, let us know in the comments more stuff you want to hear. I've 
Um, I'm taking notes and uh, saving them for future episodes on stuff that we're going to talk about. So I really appreciate all the feedback. Um, and if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, like the videos because it really helps support our channel. Uh, and we will catch you guys in the next episode. Cheers. <laughs>